Yeah, wait until next week. We have a final one next week. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know that we have a bit of a um, sparse audience at the moment, but I'm sure that true to form, people will continue to walk in. So and I have a couple announcements first. Um, I was negligent last month or the beginning of this month in notifying people of you know who had the most attendance at Grand Rounds. So for the month of October, uh, we had four individuals, Steve Winters, Luis Marsano, Forrest Arnold, and Burt Watson. And for November, seven individuals, um, Endeshaw Omer, Dependra Parajuli, Burt Watson, Forrest Arnold, Tom Dews, Stacy Mandrola, and Frank Parker. And I'm going to remind everybody that um, for the past couple of months now, you know, we have the extra special Panera gift card in there that is worth more than the usual small one. So you will have, uh, for the month of October, those guys will have a one in four chance um, of getting the, the larger gift card. Um, so the other uh, announcement that I wanted to make was that I wanted to thank everybody in the uh, Department of Medicine uh, for the participation in the Raise Some L program. Uh, the School of Medicine was third in the whole university in participation. <clears throat> and I want to call out one individual in our department who was actually ranked number seven campus-wide for number of participants, and that's Jen Cook. Jen Cook, who was able to gain the participation of 21 individuals um, who donated uh, during that however many number of hours that that was. <clears throat> so congratulations to, uh, to Jen. And next week, I hope to be able to tell you guys um, a better idea of what our global participation was in the Department of Medicine and how much money that we raised. So, <clears throat> excuse me, with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker who actually needs no introduction. Um, this larger than life character uh, at the University of Louisville has definitely made his mark. Uh, Dr. Craig McLean, uh, who is the co-chief of the uh, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, um, has uh, distinguished himself here as a researcher, a teacher, uh, and a clinician, all three. He holds leadership positions within the university um, in research. Um, he has participated, I will say for decades, um, at the NIH level um, in uh, uh, study sections and other grant review sections. Um, he uh, has also been continuously funded for how many years, Craig? A long time, continuously funded, federally funded uh, for a long time, including uh, VA merit review funding um, as well as NIH funding. His research has centered on primarily liver, liver injury, mechanisms of liver injury in response to insults, um, the use of specific supplements uh, to try to ameliorate this liver injury. He also has um, uh, deep interests in uh, nutrition, um, the gut barrier, and as well as more recently, uh, the microbiome. But today, he is going to talk about probably one of his great loves, you know, which is cirrhosis of the liver, and today going to talk about the complications of decompensated cirrhosis. So let's welcome Dr. McLean to the podium, <clears throat> and we expect an exciting interactive talk. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, a lot of uh, great things are actually happening. We, we just uh, finished our national. Bell had over uh, 50 patients this past weekend. 
third half of college. February, half day from the college room. All residents, fellows, uh, And then talk about the Pharisees, Pisces. First, we're going to start out with picture specific. First patients uh, has hepatitis C cirrhosis with a plus societies, low platelet levels, is low mild renal dysfunction. Had a previous episode of got a chronic special. So what is the best pain therapy for some? Centamethin, ibuprofen, codone plus a centamethin. So, pick your contracting. Uh, Don't let you pick one. <laughs> Okay, so fantastic. So the audience got this right. They never go out in private community. So it's a sentimental. So the second patient is a white female with hepatitis C cirrhosis, small Pharisees, and she was cured of her hepatitis. So. Sound response from the person. More about this. So uh, the right answer is uh, to the protein. Critically important. Ways. Third one is uh, a 53 year old male with Nash cirrhosis, claims of being tired all the time. Tired. Able to sleep. Got a BMI of 43, apnea, cephalopathy. For the record, great person. Fourth patient, a 63 year old male with alcohol cirrhosis. He uh, got lost in the parking lot. The uh, physical exam, he had tremors, he had sarcopenia. So, which of the following? for 
say. Never approach it. Twenty-three-year-old Asian, Hodges B. Cirrhosis, known Barris, vomits their blood at home, brought to the ER. First, for an overview on decompensated liver disease. We have over 10 million have the most common causes you can see here is Current U.S. birds of Napple today. So cirrhosis is the eighth leading cause of death in the United States, and these are uh, data that are really the most recent epidemiologic data from the US. And you can see here the increase in um, NASH and alcohol-related liver disease and the decrease that you start to see here with direct acting agents uh, with hepatitis C. So mortality is going down, but uh, other causes are going up. And so, the critical factor is that there's been a 65% increase in deaths from cirrhosis over this period of time, a doubling of hepatocellular carcinomas at a time when other liver cancers are going down. And Kentucky is number one. So we're increasing at a 6.8% a year death rate in Kentucky due to liver disease. So the stages of cirrhosis are either a compensated state with either mild or insignificant portal hypertension, uh, clinically relevant portal hypertension, or you go on to decompensated cirrhosis and then decompensated cirrhosis with major complications and death. And so what we want to do is try and keep people in this phase over here or regress. So one of the problems is recognizing compensated cirrhosis is sometimes difficult because they basically look pretty normal. A lot of times they get sent to us because they have thrombocytopenia, muscle wasting. Uh, the AST can be higher than the ALT. That's usually not the case in NASH or viral related liver disease. Sometimes the liver enzymes are normal. And sometimes the etiology is either remote or not recognized, so alcohol abuse 10 or 15 years ago. Obviously, we hope we recognize decompensated disease. Now, the natural history, again, relates to whether you're compensated or decompensated. So if you're compensated without varices or even with varices, your short-term mortality is low and your median survival is great. But if you're decompensated, your short-term survival gets worse and worse here, and even your median survival is very low. And so, again, we want to keep people compensated. So what are screening tests that we need to do on all of our patients? Well, upper endoscopy to determine if they have varices or not. Uh, again, we talked about ultrasound and alpha fetal protein every six months. And again, that's a common way of getting sued. If you're not doing this, 
and out in the community and even in the VA hospital where we track it, um, we're not doing a great job of this. And so this is why uh, as hepatologists, we tend to follow these patients ourselves just to make sure this gets done every six months. And then we uh, test for uh, obviously hepatitis A, B, and C, and we want people vaccinated if uh, they're not immune. Uh, a big question is drugs and what medicines can they take? So most drugs can be used safely. Sometimes they have to have a little lower doses. Acetaminophen is probably the thing that where the most frequent mistakes are made, and we'll talk about that. The other area is statins. So patients can basically always take statins if they have liver disease. And if you have a question, this is a great resource uh, that is constantly kept up to date on liver toxicity that you can go to. So on acetaminophen, I actually wrote the original article in 1980 uh, and what ended up happening, it was a group of alcoholics that got a sentimentophen liver injury. And so the press and physicians misinterpreted this to think it was patients with liver disease, irrespective of what type of liver disease they have. So it's only alcoholics that are predisposed. So if you have hepatitis C or NASH, you're not more susceptible to acetaminophen, and actually it's a drug of choice for pain. And the mechanisms for this are shown here. So acetaminophen is basically metabolized, it's conjugated to sulfate or glucuronide, about 90% of it. But 10% will go through this uh, cytochrome P452E1 system, and you get this very toxic metabolite but if you bind that metabolite to glutathione, you still don't get liver injury. So the thing with alcoholics is they have this system revved up, so more toxic metabolite is made, and they have less glutathione. So that's why they get more liver injury. What about preventing complications? Well, you want to avoid elective surgery. I'll show you a couple examples of that. And you avoid non steroidals. You don't want to give them hypertensives and make them hypotensive because you'll cause renal dysfunction. And obviously, sedatives will cause encephalopathy. So, two big areas you don't operate. And it's like you literally have to grab the surgeon's hand. So, they see this umbilical hernia here, got to be fixed. And so they think, well, we'll just drain all the ascites out, we'll fix the hernia and everything's good. The ascites comes back, the hernia breaks down, the patient gets infected and dies. Dr. Marsano has yelled at people, I don't know how many times, about hepatic hydrothorax. So instead of fluid accumulating in the peritoneal cavity, it goes up to the lung and either the pulmonologist or the surgeons put a chest tube in and getting that chest tube out is virtually impossible. General recommendations, try for good things. Keep normal weight. Uh, a lot of our patients have NASH, so you try and optimize the metabolic syndrome. You immunize patients, which we don't do well enough, especially at U of L because it's difficult to do. And you want to do the screening test that all patients should get. So what about varices? Well, they occur in about 50% of cirrhotics over their lifetime. And the worse your cirrhosis, the more likely you are to have varices. And so you develop them at about a rate of 8% a year. So how do we monitor uh, varices? Well, if you have compensated cirrhosis and you don't have varices originally, why then, if you still have active disease, so your hepatitis C is active, you're still drinking, you get surveilled every two years. If it's inactive, that happens every three years. If you have 
known varices, small varices on screening, then it's uh, every year if you have ongoing liver disease or every two years if the injury is uh, quiescent. And so this is what we use to treat patients. So it's either non-selective beta blockers or endoscopic uh, band -like ligation. And um, so this is effective at uh, preventing people from uh, bleeding. Now, what about if you do bleed? Well, this occurs in people with varices with about 5 to 15% uh, a year. And the predictors, the biggest one, again, is decompensation, so the worst liver disease with big varices and these red whale markings. And the big issue with uh, bleeding is that there's a high mortality at six weeks. And people usually don't spontaneously stop bleeding. <laughs> Patients with suspected variceal hemorrhage should go to the intensive care unit. So again, somebody goes to the ER, they're throwing up blood, they have known cirrhosis and varices, that patient should not get admitted to the ward. They need to go to the ICU. Again, we know now that we don't want to overtransfuse these people. They should get short-term antibiotic prophylaxis because there's a very high rate of infection with these patients. The endoscopy should be performed within 12 hours. And so this is from this uh, landmark New England Journal article where they showed that you had a better outcome if you didn't overtransfuse than when you tried to uh, normally what we used to do was get their hemoglobin up above 10. So now we know we shoot for seven. What about bacterial infection? So bacterial infections are incredibly common after uh, GI bleeding. And so that's why we give antibiotics in these patients to uh, try and prevent that. What about ascites? So it's the most common complication that we see. Um, about 60% of patients with compensated cirrhosis will develop ascites within 10 years. Once you develop it, the mortality rate's about 50% in three years. And a kind of rough rule of thumb is once you develop ascites, that's a good time to start thinking about referring your patient to a liver transplant program. Differential diagnosis, about 85% of people with ascites have uh, just usual cirrhosis, but there's a variety of other things that they have. I've actually seen uh, two people in the last couple of weeks with nephrogenic ascites, so you have to think about the other causes. When you do a, a tap, these are the things that you clearly want to get every time. Um, well, not every time, but uh, diagnostically. And that's a cell count and differential, looking for infection, albumin, so you can do a SAG, and a total protein. And then depending on the clinical situation, there are some other things that you may look for uh, shown here. <laughs> so the management of ascites, you have tense societies, you're obviously going to do a paracentesis. Uh, if it's non-tense, why, well, you can just start off with diuretic therapy. And the diuretics that we always use are a combination of aldactone and uh, furosemide. So, and our highest doses that we usually move up to is... Um, Lasix, you're going, or furosemide, up to 120. Some people go 160, I cap at 120, and 400 of spironolactone. A important clinical component is you give the diuretic in the morning. So again, I see a lot of people coming in on BID dosing. That just keeps people up at night urinating. They already have terrible sleep cycles, so they don't sleep. So get them all to take their diuretics in the morning. About 10% of people will have refractory ascites, 
and that can be treated with large volume paracentesis on a recurring basis, tips, or liver transplantation. So what about serial paracentesis? And when is your patient lying to you? And so this is another great uh, Dr. Marsano uh, clinical uh, correlate here. So if a patient requires a paracentesis and you're taking off more than six liters every 10 days, this is all the calculations here that go into that. The patient's lying to you and they're taking in too much sodium. Can uh, check a spot uh, urine to a potassium ratio. And again, remember to do albumin infusion if you're taking off more than five liters. So if you take off less than five liters, you don't have to do that. But more than five liters, they need to get albumin so they don't go into uh, renal failure. And this obviously shows you why. So this is one of my patients, huge ascites. And so you can see the pulmonary distress they can have with this, why they don't feel like eating. And think about all the protein that's included in there that you're gonna tap off. And so that's why I don't like recurrent large volume paracentesis is you're taking off a large amount of protein. But obviously the patient looks a lot better afterwards. So another alternative is TIPS, where basically you're taking a rotor-rooter through the liver here and improving blood flow. So you're decreasing the uh, uh, difficulty with blood flow getting back to the systemic circulation. And so TIPS is a great alternative uh, the biggest problem with this is recurrent encephalopathy afterwards. So this is a meta-analysis uh, on survival on TIPS versus a large volume paracentesis. Um, there's a slight improvement with TIPS. Uh, the thing that, again, I like about TIPS is you're not taking off fluid with valuable protein on a regular basis. And so hopefully these people are gonna maintain a better nutritional status. The critical factor is selecting your patients. So if your patients have a higher MELD, if they have a MELD of 22 or 23, this is not gonna be somebody that does well. So there are a variety of uh, calculations calculators that are used to look at uh, who should get their tips and who shouldn't. Uh, this is one paradigm here, a, a low platelet count or a bilirubin greater than three. But um, the important thing is that patients also have to have good renal function. So obviously, if uh, somebody has a paddle renal syndrome, why they're probably not gonna respond to a tips. Lastly, hepatic encephalopathy. So encephalopathy is really our first example of alterations of the gut-brain axis. And so um, the toxins that cause the encephalopathy are made in the GI tract. And so that's why broad-spectrum antibiotics, non-absorbable antibiotics, and lactulose work <coughs> because it alters the uh, gut flora. And um, so if you take something like a rifaximin, why you will decrease ammonia production, but ammonia is kind of only a surrogate for a bunch of other bad things that are generated in the eye tract that then go to the brain and cause encephalopathy. So, and when you think of encephalopathy, you usually think of somebody that's comatose. And that's really the tip of the iceberg. So again, we coined this term uh, minimal encephalopathy back in the 1980s. And this is what most of our patients have and why they actually um, have bad quality of life. 
So I have a huge number of people that uh, are professionals, but really aren't very functional or can't function at work anymore because they can't do tasks. And so this is the thing that we showed in this paper here. So you can talk to these guys socially. You can talk to them about the basketball game and how the heck did we lose uh, the other night? And they will know everything about who scored, who got fouled. But then if you ask them to do a task, and here this is called a number connection test where you try and connect these numbers as quick as you can. And you can see this guy's a little shaky here. Uh, and a normal person should do this in under 60 seconds. And so when you give people a specific task to do, why then they're not very good at it. And so this is why they're also not good at driving and probably shouldn't be driving. So there are two real forms of HE that are recognized. So the covert or minimal encephalopathy uh, affects about 20% to 80% of people. And it's actually uh, close or 60% that's closer to this number here. Um, and it's multiple terms have been used, subclinical encephalopathy, minimal encephalopathy, and it's an encephalopathy that, again, is hard to recognize unless you do some type of uh, specialized test to see can they perform well. The overt encephalopathy uh, will show you how to categorize it, but uh, you should be able to figure that out. And again, TIPS is one particular situation where again, you cause shunting of blood around the liver where people are more likely to become encephalopathic. So again, the covert stages or are the minimal encephalopathy or stage one. So this you really have to use psychomotor testing for. Uh, this patients have trivial lack of awareness, uh, aren't performing as well at work, uh, um, and you can usually pick this up by history. Stage two, the differentiation, is now you have disorientation to time. And then stage three is much greater confusion and gross disorientation. Stage four is coma. So that's how we always categorize encephalopathy, both clinically and on a research basis. So with encephalopathy, you want to look for precipitating factors. So most people who come in with acute encephalopathy have some factor that's caused them to tip over. And so a frequent one is uh, sedatives or tranquilizers. So that's again, when we talked about pain medicine, you don't give morphine if you can help it. Um, you don't give sleeping medicines. I never give sleeping medicines to my patients. Infection uh, is a major cause. GI bleeding, uh, blood is a very ammoniogenic in the GI tract. Fluid and electrolyte abnormalities are very common. So um, patients often come in with hyponatremia, for example or hyperkalemia. And a hyperkalemia, one of the biggest problems we can run into is um, we have the patients on Lasix and aldactone. We have their potassium finely balanced and uh, they go to the grocery store and buy a salt substitute. But it's a potassium containing salt substitute, so that drives their potassium up. Constipation is another big thing. So lactulose is one of the few drugs where we don't care what the actual dose that the patient's taking. What we care about is having three loose bowel movements a day. So I don't care whether they're taking 10 cc's or 50 cc's a day. What we want to do is titrate that to three loose bowel movements a day. So if you look at all of the reasons why people come in with encephalopathy, actually 
lactulose noncompliance is by far number one. And people don't like to take it because it's this kind of syrupy junk that tastes terrible and it gives you a lot of gas and bloating and people don't like that either. But it's highly effective. And it was actually our first prebiotic that we can think of. So if you look at fixing the GI tract, fixing the gut flora, that's basically what lactulose does. So it's a prebiotic that gets metabolized by gut bacteria. Treatment options for hepatic encephalopathy. Obviously, lactulose is the uh, first one that we use. Uh, rifaximin, we often add on to it, so a non-absorbable antibiotic. Um, the biggest problem there is often getting insurance companies to pay for it. We often use a specialty pharmacy to work with us on that. Almost nobody uses neomycin because of its uh, potential toxicity. Um, the only time I see it used is in cases uh, people can't afford. Uh, and zinc is a essential trace metal that uh, sometimes helps with hepatic encephalopathy. And we have a lot of our patients on zinc supplementation. <coughs> so in conclusion, decompensated cirrhosis has a high risk for mortality. It requires detailed medical attention, but can have a very positive outcome. That's shown by this patient here that we showed you earlier. So he was an alcoholic cirrhotic, but he was abstinent for two years, didn't smoke, and now he has no ascites. Better humans for. So this is one of the biggest opportunities, I think, in liver disease right now, is we're coming up with new drugs that are antifibrotic agents. And a lot of these are nuclear hormone receptors, and there are a whole host of these in clinical trials right now. And so I think if we can take patients and minimize the insult that we're giving to the liver, so decrease the alcohol, get them not to gain weight, uh, get their hemoglobin A1C down under 10. <laughs> Why? Uh, we can take away part of the insult and then add a medicine that causes remodeling of that fibrosis. Why we have a great chance of keeping people either compensated so they don't move to decompensated or maybe even reversing the cirrhosis. So, let me stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Dr. Marciano, come on up here. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So, um, have, um, the first mention the efficacy of lactose, other agents. Now moving to the second, no. like Linsys. No. Um, so, so lactulose is a um, poorly absorbed disaccharide. So again, it's uh, metabolized by gut bacteria. It makes the uh, pH of the colon go down. So that's when we were actually doing lactulose studies. Why that was how we evaluated whether people were it or not. So that makes ammonia less absorbable. So you make less ammonia and it makes it less absorbable and you have increased transit. So multiple factors that you won't get with uh, just giving it. So it depends on your underlying cause of liver disease, but probably I'd say about one to three percent a year. One out of five to two percent. Well, come on up here. Um, yeah, it depends on the etiology, the higher risk, hepatitis B related, 
Uh, Nash and Patari C are very important. The other ones are a little less, but all of them exceed 1.5 cases per year. For that reason, they don't need surveillance because it's a mini surveillance. Right, so the uh, question is for sleep, can they take melatonin? And I'm not sure that there's any reason that they shouldn't be able to. Do you? Yeah, there is no yeah. contraindication. Right. Uh, most people, if they are going to use something or they are going to use trastodone, that's not contraindication. Uh, Hydroxyzine seems to have a certain that is another. But the most important thing is, is that we consider this insomnia as the first sign of. Earth of Right. Yeah, so ba basically altered sleep-wake cycle is a early uh, indicator of encephalopathy. So treat the encephalopathy and they often get better. Do you have a second question? Yeah. So I actually get people uh, the first time I see them to, or oftentimes, maybe not the first time, the second time, to actually bring in all their medicine so I can look at it and see. So I uh, am not a big fan of most supplements just because uh, you're aware of their, there's potential for contamination depending on where you get them from. And um, there's a, Supplements are a big uh, cause of drug-induced liver injury, so I'm generally anti-supplements. Uh, on the other hand, obviously our early NASH patients are all on vitamin E. Um, we like uh, certain types of probiotics, so there are certain things we like. Um, it's just... Uh, Impaired water excretion is the uh, bottom line. So you retain more water, and that's the treatment for hyponatremia is fluid restriction. A anything new that you know of, Luis? No, no. The vascular is going to help from the treatment, which is water treatment. And the other two groups, we want to be the one to be more contracted uh, and wipe them. Because uh, we, when we are to intensive therapy, and for that reason, that's why we always try to minimize the dose of the we have a black uh, box uh, warning uh, related to, to liver disease, and can they be used? Yes, sometimes it's uh, uh, but, uh, but it's not a long term. Long -term Many of these patients is related to the renal dysfunction, which you can increase by increasing near arterial pressure. They have a incredible thirst sometimes. I mean, it's just uh, hard to believe, but uh, you know, so sometimes you almost have to lock the bathroom that uh, they're just incredibly thirsty, and you see people coming in uh, uh, chewing on ice chips all the time, too. Yeah, and if it's a saliva cell, they, if, if, you know, if you have made rounds in the liver service, in rounds, the first thing you do is enter a room. So everybody has to right. eat, and they are full of water and ice, and, and all nonsense, again, it's just terrible. They, they, So, so you know, another intervention that could help would be to ensure that they're getting adequate. No. So, I mean, 
des atouts sur la question. And that's a, again, a critical factor with our patients. So they get sarcopenic easily. So if you look at cirrhotics, uh, they have decreased anabolic hormones. So they lose muscle mass because of that. They have impaired protein intake. So we always want protein up. And as you get older, why you have uh, difficulty maintaining muscle mass. And unfortunately for all of us in the audience, for muscle mass, older means over the age of 45. So everybody should be at the gym pumping iron. <coughs> The uh, potassium to uh, sodium ratio. Yeah, if this yeah. comes from uh, three prospective randomized right. studies, the first study, the study was like um, who took patients who were placed in a two gram per diet, they were placed in a single dose of diabetes in the morning. The 24 hour urine was collected and samples were taken at different times to see if there was a predictor of proper natriuresis. And what was found is half a sodium to potassium ratio more than one. Ideally, uh, several hours after they took the diabetic, that has a predictive value of around 92% that a patient should be in a zero or a negative sodium value. So it will be a stronger predictor of who is responding to the proper dose of diabetes. That's the way we regulate. We start with a lower dose, and if they are not having a sodium to potassium ratio that is adequate, we double. And then we double, and we double until we win, or we decide that the patient has fractured ascites, and then the patient is likely to die, and they should do something else, and that's transplant. So you do that with the spot urine. So in the old days, you try and do 24-hour urine collection. That, that's just not feasible. So that's why you do the spot urine. Well, our 24 Yeah, so um, certainly with our transplant patients, uh, you know, we get regular DEXs on them, but with our liver patients in general too, once they get cirrhosis, why there are greater risks for osteoporosis and uh, especially our patients um, with diseases like PBC, they're even at higher risk. Now, the other interesting thing though, that I've seen in the last, uh, to two to three weeks is once in a while you can get hypercalcemia with renal, or with the liver. Mechanisms aren't well worked out, but uh, seen a couple patients recently. But part of it is in it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Larry.